Hi, everybody. Mike Butcher from TechCrunch and Charles Cardano. Your reputation uh, precedes you somewhat. <laughs> How, how's it going? Are you enjoying Lisbon? Oh, it's a beautiful place. The last time I was in Portugal was Porto, and this is a dry year, so I don't get to play with any of the nice wines here. That's the only sad part. Is uh, Portugal on the map for you in crypto terms? Uh, you know, I, I used to do the whole European tour, so you'd go and do Germany and Switzerland, and then go to France, and then go down to Spain and Portugal, and then go up to the UK, sometimes Italy. But the community here has grown tremendously over the last three years, so yeah. it's, a, it's a new hub. It's definitely a new hub for you. There's, a, there's actually also, because uh, Portugal's been quite crypto friendly in regulation terms and taxation terms, yeah. uh, a lot of people have taken advantage of that. Yeah, well, you got the golden visa program, you got good taxes. Uh, I mean, Europe in general is starting to embrace crypto. Uh, from the regulatory side, Mika just got pushed through and they're starting to standardize regulations and talk about asset classification and tax policy and these things. The UK is the odd man out right now. Uh, they're, they're trying to figure out their own way. But it's, uh, it's ahead of the US in terms of that. And there's a lot of great startups in the Web3 space that are in uh, Germany and other places. And they're starting to get a bit more diversified throughout Europe. Is, it, is there anything in particular you're particularly passionate about in, in the crypto space? Uh, obviously, <laughs> apart from your own projects. Well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in crypto right now. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff on the horizon. Uh, so we're right in the middle of the third generation of cryptocurrencies. So the first generation was decentralization, and that's what Bitcoin brought us, and it's the winner. The second was smart contracts of programmability, and that's what Ethereum brought us. And the third generation, scalability, interoperability, and governance. And there's tons of protocols that are in this space. You have Algorand and Near, and you have Tezos and Cardano and so forth, and we're all kind of battling it out. And eventually some winners will occur. But uh, on the horizon, we looked at things like the fourth generation, and there you have multi-resource consensus, identity built into the system, a lot of post-quantum stuff. So there's an endless river of, of cool things that uh, we pay attention to, both on the academic side, because we write research papers, we've written over 150, and then on the engineering side as well, and then on the product side uh, for adoption. But it's, uh, it's just crazy the scale of things. 300 million cryptocurrency users worldwide now. It went from zero to 300 million in 13 years. I think that, that, that it's, so, it's interesting, isn't it, to think, uh, when people say to me, you know, you know crypto's over, it's not going to go anywhere, I just say, how many people were on the internet in around 1998, 1999, right. and they, uh, they, nobody never knows, and I said it was about two, 300 million. Yeah. And, then, and, I, and then I say, how many people have wallets? And, I, and they say, oh, it's about two, 300 million. And then they go like, oh, so it's 1999, in Web3, in a way. Yeah, you know, actually, Elon buying it's Twitter still a long way to go. is probably going to bring crypto to 200 million people there. You know, he, he has every intention of some form of crypto integration. I think that's why Binance put half a billion dollars in. And he's obviously a fan of Dogecoin, and it's doing quite well, because there's a belief that there's going to be some form of integration in the horizon. And, you know, this is you know, old business for him. He had X.com back in the 90s. I'm glad you mentioned Dogecoin, because Cardano has, has been talking about uh, you know, creating on-ramps for, for yeah. Dogecoin. What's your latest thinking about that subject? So, we're now exiting an adversarial age where there's tons of layer ones and they all hate each other and throw hand grenades at each other. And we're entering a more collaborative age where people are started trying to get this technology to work together, so interoperability. So part of that is how do you figure out how to get old and new blockchains alike to talk to each other so they can move users, value, information, uh, metadata, whatever it is, uh, in, in a way kind of like we have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth where you just have ubiquitous interoperability. So it'd be a lot of fun to see if we could find a way to make Doge a side chain of Cardano or at least build a bridge there, especially if the intention uh, for Twitter is an integration there. Because the technology of Doge is based on Bitcoin and it can't scale to 200 million users. They just simply could not do a large scale deployment on a network like that. So they're going to need some overlay to assist them and, and do that. So at some point someone will get that deal. So I, I don't have any information on it, but if I had to guess, I think that's what Binance is, uh, is kind of pushing for. Uh, yeah, I was going to basically ask you, do you have any, uh, no. any information I mean, on what half Musk is going to do in Twitter it. and crypto? Yeah, he put a half billion dollars into it. That's a pretty big check size if it's just a, a passive investment. I, I think there's every intention to be part 
of the crypto conversation. And you can either be part on the infrastructure side, the liquidity side, as a regulated financial actor. There's a litany of things you can do. And for a platform as large and pervasive as Twitter, you need all of the above. You need identity solutions like DIDs, you need wallet solutions, you need exchanges, you need algorithms to curate information, you need smart contract capabilities. NFTs could play a major role because you could represent an account or information as an NFT. Like this is a big thing in journalism that's going to be a huge problem within 24 months. If you look at AI and the rate of progress with deep fakes, eventually we're going to cross an inflection point where it's quite common with consumer level AI to create a deep fake that's indistinguishable from a normal video or picture. And then you could imagine people creating fake news. So you need to bind the creation of information with some sort of proof of authenticity and origin of it. And NFT is actually a perfect aspect for that. And you know, Twitter could bring that to the market. So you think NFTs are going to be this sort of verification kind of uh, methodology. What do you think about, I mean, just a slight segue. What do you think about all this stuff about the $8 ver verification? You think that's just gaslighting? No, I think it's a great idea because if he pulls it off, um, as the platform grows, that premium model could end up being a multi-billion dollar revenue line, which diminishes the role advertisers have on the platform because they can start saying, Twitter, you're not the product. You know, these social media platforms, you're the product. There's a great book called Surveillance Capitalism that kind of talks about this and everybody knows that when they use Facebook and Twitter and these other things, at the end of the rainbow, their data is going to be harvested and used for facilitating marketing or other purposes. And so when you have a premium verification line, you now have a direct relationship with your customer. And that means that you don't have to sell ads, which means right. he doesn't have to be beholden to any external force. Okay, well I guess, I mean, I guess that we could, we could go down that line, but let's talk about Cardano. Sure. So, there's obviously there's been the crypto so-called crypto winter now we're in so-called you know what's your take on things where things are right now um, I mean let's be honest that's that Cardano's prices have crashed um, where are, where are you, what's your feeling right now about the subject well I mean everything's crashed you know the stock market's down nine trillion dollars that's uh, that's a big number we have like eight percent annualized inflation if you believe the CPI it's probably more like 15 20 percent. You know, there's boom and bear markets, and I've been in Bitcoin since before it was a dollar, and now look where it's at. So I don't tend to look at the micro. What I tend to look at is uh, more meaningful metrics and statistics. In particular, you look at the use and utility. So you look at projects. There's over 100 that have launched, 1,000 in the way. We're number three for NFT volume right now, 100 million plus in volume per month. Uh, we have uh, six million assets that have been issued on Cardano, and you know, year by year, month by month, um, every metric from uh, social metrics like Twitter uh, traffic, Reddit traffic, Telegram traffic, they're growing quite considerably. So the overall size and scale of the platform is growing. Whether the price goes up and down, I mean, Amazon plummeted in 2000, took till 2011 for them to recover. But they're obviously a very different company in that respect. So you have to focus on the long term, the use, utility, and the community and say, is it healthy and sustainable? And the answer is yes. We've grown more this year than we did in 2021, even though 2021 was the biggest bull market of all time. How many people here own Cardano? A whole bunch of people. Not keep, a small community. Keep, Ghost chain, keep, right? Keep your hand up if you're happy. Roughly, oh, you got still got some fans. Um, you've also talked about uh, in recent sort of press. Uh, you've talked about you know the developer tools. Who here's uh, developing on blockchain? You know, engineering. Yeah. So there's still you know there, there's still a lot to go. Tell us you know you know Ethereum has always really had the kind of you know the, the, the biggest developer community. How are you planning to grow your developer community? Well, first off, there's 25.4 million developers worldwide, and there's only probably about 80 to 120,000 Solidity developers. So this myth that Ethereum has the network effect, they have the network effect within a bubble. It's a small pond relative to the ocean of all developers. And the big developers have yet to come on board. And there's plenty of things being built outside of the Ethereum ecosystem than inside the Ethereum ecosystem. So it's an early day situation. So what we tend to look for is we say, okay, 
do we have the ability to absorb the development model of multiple blockchains? With sidechains we do, and that's something we're exploring next year. So you have EVM compatibility, you know, other ecosystems will come. And so developers who are already acclimated there, they can just roll over and use it. Just like when you write Java code, you can write it for a desktop application or you can write it for an Android application. Or JavaScript, you can write it for the browser or the desktop or the iPhone or the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Then what's nice about Plutus is that uh, the core language of Cardano is it was designed for a very specific type of developer and application. So high assurance applications. So things where there's billions of dollars at stake, they're mission critical, and if shit goes wrong, people die or they lose money. Think of like the Boeing 737 MAX. Bad software kills people. So what we wanted to do is have a strong verified core and then a big constellation of side chains that bring new capabilities to the platform, and then you can absorb developers uh, you know, at a pretty good rate. Uh, and we've already shown that with good stuff inside the core, you can get verticals quickly. Like for example, by having the best native asset standard for issuing tokens on Cardano, we were able to grow exponentially in the NFT space. It's so simple to issue an airdrop NFTs on Cardano, and that's why our volume is so high, and six million of them have been issued. We didn't plan that. There was no bureau of NFTs in Cardano, and we were like, boy, we have to go conquer these guys. They, the community just did it themselves. In fact, they invited me to a conference, and I thought maybe like 200 people would show up. Community-led conference, 3,000 people were there, and we had 144 projects. And I, I was just blown away by the evangelism. And it was impossible to walk around the exhibition area because everybody wanted a picture. And yeah, that's fun. So that's really where it's at. You, you have to have a, a multi-computation model where you adopt different paradigms and an easy way to bring that in. You have to honor the legacy, not just the solidity, but the legacy legacy, so the other 25 million developers. And then you have to have verticals where you're very good at things. Like next year, Marlowe comes. It's going to be super easy to write financial contracts that are provably secure. Super important for the flow of money, for lending, for DeFi, these things, because if you screw up those contracts, you lose all your money. And it's super important also to focus on growth areas like GameFi, Metaverse, NFTs, and have competitive USPs. So uh, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with where we're at. I, of course, would like better development experience and better documentation and everything to be perfect. But remember, this is a new programming model. It just came out last year, and usually when you create a new programming language, it takes about three to five years for it to really get comfortable. And the fact that we've been able to accomplish so much in under a year is, is pretty impressive. Cardano is now the third largest uh, NFT protocol by trading volume, uh, according to uh, some uh, research from DAP Radar. Uh, where, what's your thinking about where NFT, NFT space can go from here? So NFTs are super useful when you start talking about representations of assets uh, that have very particular value to a very particular domain. For example, you own a house or a car or a boat. The deed for that thing can be represented as an NFT. Your medical records could be represented as an NFT. Um, supply chains, items in a supply chain, they could be represented as an NFT. So we have an ESG thing where we want to track all the carbon in the world. It's going to be a $150 trillion overhaul to bring in COP26. Blockchain and NFTs are going to probably play a significant role there. We already mentioned the provenance of content. So who created the video and the, the authentication certificate for it, so for deep fakes, these types of things. But you also combine intellectual property to NFTs, patents, uh, the IP for music. This is why so many musicians have entered the space because they want to have a direct relationship with their audience and a direct licensing scheme. So it goes far beyond like uh, you know, Bored Apes and, and Space Buds and Ape Society and all these types of things. It goes much more into, I have a unique thing that I need to represent in a unique way, and I need to have portability and economic agency with it, and the ability to put metadata on it. So then we could talk about the story of who owned it and these types of things. And it runs complementary to the more fungible things, which are like cryptocurrencies or crypto securities or these types of things. You mentioned earlier uh, you're interested in the DeFi space. I know you're also an investor as well. What sort of, uh, where, where are you thinking about the, the the DeFi space, where that's headed right now, and what do you think about the, the health of that, that ecosystem? 
So we started a $25 million fund, so it's a small one, um, called C Fund, uh, and basically it invested in Cardano DeFi because we wanted to get a better understanding of these things, and it's a pretty nice portfolio, maybe 20, 30 companies, and they range from DEXs to Oracles to stable coins and these types, so all the usual suspects, but then we also looked a lot into the analytics and reporting, we looked a lot into the data layer, identity layer, these types of things. Uh, so, what's cool about it is that if you get involved early enough, you can kind of watch them grow and evolve, and it's more than a passive investment relationship, it's a partnership where you can use them for customer feedback to help you evolve your platform. So, for example, Hydra is a state channel technology that we've been building all this year uh, for Cardano to help scale dApps on Cardano, and we got to a point where we say we'd like Cardano developers to start integrating Hydra as a case study, well, we just went to the CFUND portfolio because we already had the relationship. We called them up and said, hey, would you like to be a pioneer and actually work with us on this? They said, sure, of course. So now Sunday Swap is, is doing that and Obsidian is doing that with Load Wallet. And so there's, there's a litany of people us using that. So it's, it's nice in this space because you go beyond a passive role and you exist more in a role of, of uh, a partner and you can kind of co-evolve and co-build with them. So you wear multiple hats in that respect. It a lot of people, I could ask you a question like, what are you most excited about, etc. What are you most down on? What do you think people should stop talking about or move away from right now? Well, I think the most damaging thing in the industry is still maximalism, um, especially Bitcoin maximalism. It's incredibly dismaying to have a group of people who think that all innovation stopped January 3rd of 2009. And everything beyond that is a scam, and everybody who touches that is an evil person who needs to be put in jail. You know, I did a lot of regulatory work this year. I spoke before Congress, the House Ag P Committee. We spoke to dozens of congressmen and senators, had dinner with a few of them, talked to the CFTC, we talked to a lot of agencies. And what I found out was that there were Bitcoin maximalists not only getting involved in the conversation, but they were actively lobbying Congress to ban everything but Bitcoin you know, make everything a security or make everything illegal. And it was just incredibly frustrating and dismay. You know, it, first it's intellectually dishonest and then second, it accomplishes nothing. You know, uh, this is one industry, one ecosystem and we all have to live together, work together. And we of course over Twitter can, you know, mock people and say things that sometimes are regrettable. But at the end of the rainbow, if a person called me in the space that's an open source protocol and they say we'd like to collaborate and it made sense that there's mutual value, I'd never say no. The Polkadot booth is just right down the hot other thing. There's, there's plenty of people here and if they have something they're working on that we're working on, it makes perfect sense to collaborate. Maximalism makes it impossible to collaborate. Because what you've done is said, my competitor is not somebody I disagree with. My, com my competitor is a criminal. My competitor is evil. My competitor should be in jail. Oh, by the way, let's collaborate. The community can't right. do it. And so that, I've been down on that for a long time and I, I wish it would go away. And it just seems to keep rearing its ugly head in that respect. Fair comment, fair comment. Well, I guess, you know, that's a good point. Uh, which and we're out of time, the clock says, and we've, you've made a great point. Uh, Charles, it'll be great talking to you. Thanks very much for coming to Web Summit. Uh, see you again. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. <laughs>